Well, good morning. Good morning. So here we are in week 500 of this heat. It will never end. Uh, so a couple quick announcements. So one is that I leave for vacation this week. So now, now is the applause? Thank God he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am headed out, and your bulletin is our senior warden's phone number. If you have need of something, please contact her. Patty will be more than happy to direct you to whatever the appropriate person taking care of the thing is. So that is who I will encourage you to contact. Because uh, as you can imagine, I'm probably not going to be reading emails when I'm on the Oregon coast. Um, so that'll, that'll be good. And then I'll see you in two weeks. So next week, uh, Robin has graciously chipped in to, to leave services for next week, and then I will see you on the 25th. So, okay. Um, there's that. Uh, there is in the bulletin, if you, I see some stacks of boxes over there. Um, a call went out for Vacation Bible School because we're building a little set design of castle for Vacation Bible School, and there's still time to sign up or to volunteer to help, and Sue Nims in the back, waving her hand. If you are helping out with something, uh, please chat with her. I have more hands the merrier to, to do this fun thing at the last week of July. Um, Mary Ellen, would you, did you want to share some words about Friendship Meal and like how to get involved in things like this? Because it's, you know, it's one of those things that dawns on me that we don't talk about like friendship meal and some of these things a little more in advance about how you can be involved because there's so many different things you can do to help out with a bunch of ministries and friendship meal just came to mind. So do you want to use the microphone? I have the very bad voice. Well, I know you okay. do. I know you do. Um, so the friendship meal is a free meal that we do once a month. Uh, it's on the first Friday of every month. And the meal ingredients are donated by parishioners. We make up a menu and then we put it on a poster board and you can sign up for what you want to bring. And then you bring it to the church, the, usually the Wednesday before the meal. Also, if you're interested in becoming even maybe a little more involved, we need volunteers. We need to always use kitchen help which would be between uh, usually two to five, which is when we start serving. But serving help, especially this summer, could really be helpful. Uh, we've begun serving inside again since the weather is so hot, and it's a relief for people who may be precariously housed or not housed at all to come into the air conditioning. Also, it's a way of welcoming them as God has welcomed us. And so uh, we, that's the idea, is to reflect God's love to everyone. So um, you can always contact me or just show up. Uh, we begin serving at 5 and go until 6.30. Um, so please feel free to come. Got any questions? Okay. Thanks. Um, and I've said it once and I'll say it again, is that if you're curious about something, pretty much in most cases, you can just show up and say, hey, I kind of want to watch and see what we do and learn. Um, so like with Friendship Meal, it really is like just on that first Friday of the month. So August 6th. Yeah. Uh, we should be impressed that I remember the calendar back up right now. Um, you know, just show up and see how it works and how it functions and see where your gifts might fit in. Um, that's one of the nice things about being a community, a faith community, that is open and porous. You know, people can come in and participate. I mean, we're blessed with people that, you know, the, some of the students from Boise High actually will come during the school year, which is why summer, especially, we need help. Um, they will come in and help us. That's wonderful. We create those opportunities for service and working together. 
Um, so many people in the world think of the church as this institution and that people that wear fancy things are supposed to be making all the decisions and telling people what to do and that we are the establishment. Um, and for us as Christians, we say that no, we are all the body of Christ. And so we're all doing these ministries and sharing them together. And that it's not because someone in a collar said to do a thing, it's because we know this is how we serve God's people, how we take care of God's people, which is the whole world. Um, so deep theology and come serve foods. Those are, those are some things. Uh, and of course, there are plenty of other things that one can be involved in. Uh, if you're curious about how things work behind the scenes, the names for all those things that go up on this uh, all the altar, you can get involved in altar guild. And altar, like I can direct you to all these sorts of things. Uh, I'm I'm a nerd for a reason. I like I like this stuff. I like sharing it with people and helping you to share it with other people too, because that's how you share the joy. Okay. Is there anything that I've missed that's obvious? Okay. So, uh, we're good on music? I'm learning. I need to look to behind me to check with Shauna. Good on music. Uh, so we enter into our time of worship with sacred silence. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts for heaven, all the desires known, and from you in the secrets of the earth. Blend the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that they may perfectly love you, and that word of the man, Father, will be made through Christ our Lord.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you. O Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went to Baal Judah to bring from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the chair. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fat man. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ebony. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Mishael, daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, we will read the uh, psalm, uh, I think it's antiphonally, by the whole verse alternating. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who dwell therein. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord, and who can stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure heart, who have not blessed themselves all over the world, nor sworn by what is wrong. They shall receive a blessing from the Lord, and a just reward from the Lord of their salvation. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty and God. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them high, O everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is he to sing the Lord? The Lord of hosts, he is the Lord. A reading from the letters of the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard of the deeds of power, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying that John the Baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men and arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod, Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John, the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. <laughs> the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with others to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Reading scripture again and again, 
can sometimes be hard because we already know the story and because we already know what the, the interpretation is supposed to be. We've heard one interpretation at some point along the line, and that's the one that sticks. But the Bible is more than just one interpretation. It's layers of meaning, spiritual, literary, and theological. It's densely put together. And so we have to read it attentively again and again and again. One of the ways we can explore the Bible better is to consider the story from different angles. Are there characters that we rarely hear from or who are off to the side? Maybe they're treated as just supporting characters, or maybe they're seen as villains. What might we learn if we look at it from their point of view? So for today's readings, I want us to consider the story from the points of view of the women in these stories. We have Michal in the first reading, and we have Herodias and her daughter in the second. Let's bring them to the center and focus on them. So first we'll consider Michal, David's first wife, and the daughter of the previous king. Don't forget that. So in 1 Samuel 18, it says that Michal loved David. She helped David escape when King Saul, her father, was trying to kill David. And then, when David has gone into exile, Saul marries her off to a man named Palti while David is in exile. When David returns from exile, he brings his new wives with him, plural. And then as part of the peace settlement between David and Saul's son Ishbal, David demanded that Michal be returned to him from her current husband. Michal is then brought back and reunited with David, and Michal's second husband, Palti, is wailing behind her as she goes. What do you think is going on in her head when we get this line that she saw David and despised him in her heart? She had loved David. She helped him. She had disobeyed her father in helping him. And then David goes off in exile and gets married to some other women. And then Michal is forcibly married off to another man by her own father. She's been treated as property as a trophy. I imagine her heart is broken first by David's departure because she loved him, and then by her father's treatment of her, and then David returning with more wives in tow, and then her heart's broken again by being forcibly taken from her second husband and forcibly reunited with David. And all is part of a peace treaty between David and another guy. Who stopped to ask what she wanted? And so we get the scene for today. Here's David dancing away half naked in front of the ark. He's basically wearing just a long undershirt at this point. That's what an ephod would refer to. Maybe her heart just can't take this anymore. Her heart had been broken again and again, and here he dances half naked in a grand procession. All eyes on David. So let me add a few more verses that got that uh, aren't featured in the lectionary. David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants' maids, as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all his household to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, that I have danced before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in my own eyes. But by the maids of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Notice that the reading doesn't say God punishes Michal for what she says to David. God isn't causing her not to have children, which was so esteemed in those days. It doesn't add that God was furious with her or said that she had spoken wrongly. It doesn't say she was wrong. It's important to pay attention to what the Bible doesn't say. 
because she isn't wrong. Our hearts break for her. She was deeply wronged, treated as an object, hurt by those she loved, and mistreated by King David, no less. We see the seeds of the story that we will be turning to in two weeks when I'm back, the story of Bathsheba. Michal's story cuts down any image of a golden age. Even King David did some terrible things. Michal's story tells us how important it is to honor the dignity of every human being. No human is property. No human is a thing to be possessed, given away, traded in peace agreements, or diminished. And how tragic that a king as seemingly noble and pious as David couldn't honor the human being right in front of him. But he could honor and feed the crowds. We cannot honor humanity abstractly. We can't say we love all people if we can't love the person in front of us. So let's turn to the Gospel reading. In the Gospel reading, we have the story of Mother Herodias and her daughter. In Mark's Gospel, she might also be named Herodias in certain texts, but the ancient Jewish scholar Josephus says that her name was Salome. So the Herodian family was a chaotic mess. You laugh, it gets worse. Palace intrigue, attempted assassinations, legal executions, and more. It was, in fact, once said, it was better to be a pig than a son in the house of Herod. So Herodias, according to Josephus, had been married to Herod II, the one named Philip, but we don't really have record that he was ever really called Philip, but there's another brother Philip that they might have been conflating. Anyway, so Herod II, Herodias married to Herod II, who was also her half-uncle, and Herod II is not to be confused with the Herod from the Gospel reading, because that's Herod Antipas. That's that Herod. They're all named Herod. So the first marriage with Herod II is unpopular with the elder brother, Aristobulus? Okay, I can't remember. Um, so that, um, the eldest brother protested, so Herod II was demoted in the line of succession, and then he was later altogether dropped. And Josephus then says that Herodias initiated a divorce against Herod II, and then married Herod Antipas, who was in the line of succession. So if you've been following this, she also married her half-uncle again. Okay. Yeah, that's where we are. Now, interpretations of Herodias in the past have generally painted her as this craven, conniving person killing John the Baptist. And then, of course, Herod Antipas is sort of this weak figure who, oh, I can't do anything, but I like listening to him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being part of a family this dysfunctional? Can you imagine, like the medieval royal families, where murder and trying to keep in the line of succession and keeping good graces with certain people is what you learn to do. And of course, if you have power to kill off anybody that upsets you. And so along comes this wild man, John the Baptist. I also wonder if John the Baptist would have said anything about the first marriage, about that whole marrying your half-uncle bit, but he didn't have access to a chart that listed the family tree <laughs> to explain all these things. I spent 15 minutes, I swear, just confirming about the names right. Okay. So anyway, so John the Baptist is condemning this marriage. Well, that's a threat to Herodias because that could lead people to try to get rid of her, right? And her daughter is from the first marriage, so she's already in peril when you think about those family dynamics. So if your family's default response to everything is kill that person, and if this person is threatening the stability of your highly dysfunctional family, now of course this isn't to be doubled. I do not condone murder, okay? I think we're all clear on that one. But the Herod family is so beyond dysfunctional and the gospel readings don't really bring up all that information to the surface, because back then they didn't have to. 
even if you didn't know what the family tree looked like, you knew it was dysfunctional. You already knew they, they like to kill each other. So suddenly, Herodias isn't this conniving, craven woman behind the scenes manipulating a seemingly innocent husband who would rather have kept John the Baptist alive. Because you realize that Herod was part of this too. Suddenly, this tragically dysfunctional family of power and wealth is taking out its dysfunction on everyone else. They just happen to be in political charge. It's a soap opera about real life. So now for Herodias' daughter. In art and storytelling, she gets painted as a seductive femme fatale. And some writers would even suggest that, oh, maybe she was in love with John the Baptist and then he spurned her, and so this is her way of getting revenge. Okay, don't see much evidence of that, but okay. So what does the story really say? So her, this daughter gets sent in to dance for her stepfather's party. Okay, that does not sound healthy, okay? And he is so pleased and probably drunk that he promises to give her whatever she asks. Now, she goes to ask her mother, what should I ask for? What, what, what should I ask for? And so Herodias says, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the daughter returns and says, I'd like the head of John the Baptist on a platter. On a platter. Those words didn't appear in the way that Herodias phrased it, now did they? And in the original Greek, they actually come first, on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. Was she adding those words for a dramatic flair? Was she gleefully asking this as a little twist? Or did she even understand what she was asking for? Was she thinking, literally, the head of John the Baptist versus what often is used to ask for someone's head is, I simply want them dead. How old was she when she danced? Does she even understand that phraseology? And what should we think about her? Because we know her family is beyond dysfunctional. How could she even grow up normally in a family like Herod's? The Herodian dynasty with her mother, her stepfather, were already part of this dysfunctional, terrible, murderous family system and formed by them. So what, what hope is there for her? This is tragic. And now the tragedy comes into a clearer picture. Will this madness of this family ever end? Or will each generation just repeat it? This madness, this madness has now killed John the Baptist. And we know where this energy is going. Here we know the importance of how we're brought up. We're all influenced by the environment we grew up in. Not just in childhood, but everything since then. It forms us. So for us as Christians, we have to keep returning to Jesus, to one another, to worship, to hearing the scriptures, because we can easily go down wrong paths following those dysfunctional patterns that we've seen and experienced. We have to keep imagining a new world, a world that isn't going to just repeat and repeat those patterns that we've seen. We do it not just for ourselves, but we do it for the future generations, that children like the daughter of Herodias can grow up to be able to choose justice and compassion, that the dysfunction might be broken. Now, by putting these women at the center of their stories and listening with a compassionate heart, we see the deep human story at the heart of the Bible. We see what happens when people are dehumanized. We see why it is important to build a better world, to break the dysfunction. All it takes is for us to pay attention. Pay attention to those who are being left off to the sides to see what might be missing, to hear their story, to witness the tragedy, and let ourselves consider things from a new perspective. To see the perspective of those who are harmed and to look for the perspective of the gospel that breaks these cycles. We cannot 
undo the tragedies that have happened. But we can, with God's help, work to make a world where all are respected as children of God. We ourselves have that, that we may share this freedom with all others. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of Jesus. We believe in one God. In the power of the Holy Spirit, and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Brian, our bishop, for Joseph, our rector, for Patty and Barb, our wardens, for our vestry, for the leaders of other churches, and for all clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for our president, our governor, for Congress, our state legislature, for the justices and judges in our courts, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the communities of the Treasure Valley, and for all the people who live here, let us pray to the Lord. For the Lord, have mercy. For good weather, for the integrity of God's creation, and for our abundant harvests for all to share, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel by land, air, or water, for the sick and the suffering, and for Donna, Catherine, Cheryl, Joe, Bill and Barbara, Mark and Kim, Pam, Betty, Kathy, Catherine, Mike and Chuck, Kathy and Gary, AJ, Camden, Ashley, Karen and Keith, Chris, J. 
Gerald, Kale and Amory, Marsha, John, Carol, Jim, Jeff, Ken, Barb J, Lori, and for all those we name aloud. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have our For St. Andrew's McCall, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have For prisoners and captives, and for their safety, health, and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have For Aaron, who has entered her eternal rest, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have Remembering all who have gone before us in faith, and in communion with all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. To you, Lord our God. And let us join together in our prayer for the search for the next Bishop of Idaho. Holy God, source of life and light abundant. Look graciously upon the Diocese of Idaho in this time of transition. Your divine light animates our ministry and mission, and is your light guides us. Bless with your Holy Spirit all those who will take their part in discerning who is called to serve for the 14th Bishop of Idaho. Bless those who are discerning your call to and bless those who will sit and listen for your Holy Spirit in this time of discernment. Grant me wisdom, hope, humility, and love in this sacred task. And grant us all courage and creativity to dream boldly for the future of the diocese. Out of the abundance of your love, give us a faithful, compassionate, and great pastor to lead us in sharing the love of Christ with our communities and with one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
three weeks ago. So if you have need of anything, reminder, Patty is your contact person. She's in the back. Today's the day even. Maybe you should just start now. That's we heard things. <laughs> no, but her phone number is in there. So if you do have need of something in my absence, and it's not like a normal thing you call Nicole for, uh, chat with Patty. Okay. And uh, vacation Bible school at the end of the month. We've already talked about that. <sighs> I just fall into the 8 o'clock pattern? Is that what I'm doing right now? Yeah, because normally we do the announcements at this part in the 8 o'clock service. So I've already, I'm clearly, I need this fake page. Okay. <laughs> the thing I wanted to move to was if there were any celebrations or blessings or prayer requests or things like that that people wanted to share. There we go. That brain cell. Hold on, brain cells. <laughs> Most of you are aware that we've been trying to raise $5,000 so that the Episcopal Diocese of Idaho can be a corporate sponsor of Boise Pride. As of Thursday, we have 4890 and a couple of pledges that will get us to 5000 I just want to say thank you for another birthday. Don't ask me which one because I won't take. Perfect. <laughs> I think there's a point at which you don't have to say our birthdays anymore. Uh, there was a Facebook memory that reminded me a couple of years ago was my last birthday in my 20s. And suddenly it was that reminder of birthdays stop being fun at some point. <laughs> and then they had a point when they really fun again. But anyway, okay. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and all that are from you give. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you, At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, planets, and their forces, and describe the world for our own home. By the will they were created and From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust. And we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for this Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son, Lord of the world, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. Father, I just love you, you reconcile us. Father, I just love you, And therefore, we praise you. Joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who will look to you in heaven to proclaim with them your glory and your unending thanks. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends, and said, Take me. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. He so great his death and resurrection, as he awaited the day of his Lord God of our ancestors, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Isaac and Rebekah, God of Jacob, Leah, and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand and work in the world without us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praise of Father through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom in you and the Holy Spirit your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, in the name of Christ, who taught us, we are bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
Hallelujah. Christ our Passover is up for us. The gifts of God are the truth.
Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.